Okay, uh, so it's four o'clock and uh, we are on time with the, the first webinar of our Global Initiative 2020, a year without public space under the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we have almost uh, more than 300 uh, attendees uh, with us today. Um, I'm Luisa Bravo, uh, the president of City Space Architecture and um, the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Public Space. This initiative uh, is jointly promoted by City Space Architecture and uh, the School of Architecture at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, as you probably know, uh, City Space Architecture uh, is a non-profit organization based in Italy. We are very much into public space uh, research. Uh, we work with many universities all around the world and we also work on uh, um, implementation of uh, the new urban agenda and of the agenda 2030 of the 17 sustainable development goals. So we are partners of UN Habitat Global Public Space Program. And uh, we have been uh, collaborating with the Chinese University of Hong Kong for many years now. So we are very glad to, to have this opportunity to work together uh, on this very exciting uh, initiative on public space. Um, we, um, as a scholars uh, and activists uh, uh, working on um, uh, public space research, uh, implementation and action, felt that uh, we had uh, to give a response uh, regarding uh, public space uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, activating the international network uh, affiliated to the Journal of Public Space. So we are very glad that uh, our initiative attracted uh, so much interest uh, from so many institutions and people all around the world. And uh, we would like to thank uh, you all attendees today uh, for um, joining our first uh, webinar. Um, uh, we have a panel of uh, speakers uh, with us today, as you can see, uh, if you have the gallery view on, you can see all of them, all their faces. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, and now I give my, the floor to my colleague, Hendrik Thieven from uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Okay, um, hello everybody. And uh, thanks very much to uh, join this initiative. So, as Luisa was saying, this is uh, the first webinar of the whole series, and we hope to continue this series also with the input of many different people over the next months. Um, I will uh, quickly explain uh, who is here with us today. So uh, basically, in this first session, we invited four panelists and one commentator. And in the selection of um, those first uh, speakers, we were thinking, um, basically we selected by, by two reasons. One was uh, there are some that are already very active uh, immediately when the pandemic started to, uh, to launch the first initiatives. Uh, that was one of the reasons. And the other reason was also that we wanted to have a certain kind of representation of different people and places in the world. And basically, with that also follow this, this kind of global pandemic over different continents and share our different experiences, uh, how we basically now uh, experience this, this situation and share also um, our different um, knowledge and so on and try to help each other. Um, now, um, we have basically as, as uh, one of the, uh, the first uh, speaker will be Jeffrey Howe. He's the director of the Urban Commons Lab at the University of Washington. Um, Jeff, uh, many of you might know him, uh, has published uh, a lot on public space issues, particularly on the Pacific Rim, including Hong Kong, Taipei, and Seattle. And um, so these were also uh, locations basically where the virus uh, basically also hit the first time outside of mainland uh, China when it started. Uh, so Seattle, I think, was the first place in the US, at least that we knew of it. 
and um, uh, so this gives him one pe uh, special perspective and maybe it's also a reason why he was uh, one of the first who then also started to uh, make different initiatives to uh, online uh, to, to come together with different uh, scholars and activists to discuss uh, about the situation. Um, the second speaker will be Seta Law. Uh, maybe you can also <laughs> uh, make a, a little thing. Okay. Uh, later, uh, Seta is a, a very distinguished professor for cultural anthropology, and she is the director of the Public Space Research Group in uh, City University of New York. And uh, also, Seta, uh, very quickly, uh, when this whole uh, pandemic evolved, uh, started also with her research group, an initiative to share different experiences online. Maybe she might talk about this more. Um, then from there, we move uh, uh, more south. Um, so our third speaker is Luis Alfonso Saltos Espinosa uh, from Ecuador. Uh, in, in fact, we met all uh, Luis uh, Alfonso at the Habitat 3 conference in, in Ecuador, right? And uh, he's an architect and urban planner and also involved in many discussions at the moment in, in Ecuador and, and uh, internationally uh, related to the crisis. Um, and then as a fourth uh, speaker, we have uh, Mona Helmi, uh, who's an associate professor at the British University in Egypt. And uh, um, I know of uh, Mona because uh, she was the guest editor of a very interesting uh, special issue uh, just uh, some months ago in uh, the Journal of Public Space on placemaking in Arab cities. It's something I must say I'm very ignorant about and, and uh, I, I appreciate very much to, to uh, her work and, and bring this perspective into the discussion. And uh, we thought it it might be very interesting to hear from her experience uh, from the places where she works. So we, she will be the fourth uh, presenter. Um, after the four uh, first uh, panelists, we have a commentator and also a small presentation by uh, Jose Chong, um, who is basically uh, at the Global Public Space Program of U in Habitat. And uh, of course, we are very uh, happy to have him here in this round uh, with this very uh, particular experience because I, I believe many of the international experience come together somewhere at UN Habitat. And uh, um, it will be very interesting to, to see your perspective, but also maybe to get from you some tasks for everyone who's listening and us uh, to see how we can all uh, pull together our collective intelligence to, to help. Um, so these are all the, the different guests that we invited uh, for this first session, so I hope this will be interesting. Uh, now, um, just some kind of um, housekeeping. So basically everyone will talk uh, maximum seven minutes. Um, there, then afterwards we have a roundtable discussion. Um, as the attendee might have uh, realized, um, for this session, because also we have already 300 people joining, we decided to not enable the chat function to keep the situation a little bit more focused on the presentation. However, of course, we value all your, your input. And uh, basically, um, there is a possibility throughout the whole event to um, write us um, questions. And we have Ing Fan and uh, Stephanie Cheng who are with our team and they will go through the different questions. Of course, we cannot answer to every question because there might be 50, 100 <laughs> of, of questions, but uh, they will pick up uh, some of the ones that they find maybe the most uh, thought provoking. And uh, the other questions, uh, all questions will be basically gathered. And um, uh, one, one point of the whole way how we, we perceive or how we um, thought about this whole series of events, um, there will be in every month basically three uh, programmed sessions and also uh, everyone who's listening can also approach us to, for example, potentially also host one of those sessions or become a speaker. Um, on the other hand, in each month, uh, the last week we have reserved always Thursdays as a session where we could work through some of those questions where we haven't kind of defined everything yet. 
and where uh, we will see what comes as a, as a reaction and so on, and then uh, set up a special session uh, where we will discuss some of those questions. And also, according to this, I'll also go back to either some of the speakers before or get some other speakers in to, to answer those questions. Um, the other thing is that after this event, you will see there is a kind of survey that will pop up. Um, three small questions where, uh, where you can write your feedback to this event and also, uh, again, have a chance to, to raise some questions to particular speakers or in general. And in addition, we also created another survey that um, I think most of you have probably seen a link in the invitation uh, uh, email or also on the registration. Uh, this is a survey that is anonymous uh, and, and we will see that we won't reveal any, any personal details of anyone, uh, but we, which will help us to collect uh, data on public space issues uh, globally at this moment. They are part of a research project that, is, that we started uh, off, but which we really understand also as a kind of form of collective intelligence and we, we want them to share uh, with um, with everyone, everyone, and also in a special issue that I think Louisa might later uh, also uh, will talk about uh, that will be published later in the Journal of Public Space. Okay, so this is all from my site, and uh, I would now give the word to the first uh, speaker, to Jeff Hauck. Are you ready with your presentation? So, yes. <coughs> so Jeff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, is it? Uh, yes. All right. Wonderful. Uh, first of all, thank you to uh, Louisa and Hendrik for uh, spearheading this uh, effort. If there was a uh, silver lining in the current crisis, uh, it would be that although we are socially isolated uh, at home, uh, we have somehow become more uh, globally connected uh, with one another. Uh, so uh, we were supposed to uh, kind of give a visual tour of uh, the city in which we, we are uh, based. So that's uh, what I will be doing. Uh, and as uh, Hendrik mentioned, uh, Seattle was the first city uh, in the United States uh, with a reported case of COVID-19 back in uh, January. Uh, but it wasn't until uh, early March when uh, the city began to shut down and it happened very quickly. Uh, first, it started with my own uh, university, the University of Washington was uh, the first in the country to cancel all uh, in-person classes, uh, followed by public libraries, schools, uh, cafe, uh, restaurants, uh, playgrounds, sports, and so on. Uh, it was just, uh, like a rock call under our feet. Uh, things that we take for granted uh, all of a sudden uh, have their doors shut. And uh, in the state of Washington, the uh, essential businesses are still open, uh, but the, uh, like many places else, you know, social and physical distancing has transformed how urban spaces are used, uh, from standing in line uh, to getting into a uh, grocery market, uh, if you're allowing to go in at all, and to the way parts and open space are uh, used. And in uh, Seattle, as Many businesses are closed and with storefront uh, boarded up. Uh, these uh, storefronts have uh, become a canvas uh, for local artists. And uh, so many of these efforts are actually uh, coordinated uh, with neighborhood organizations reaching out to artists and with a donation of supplies and materials from uh, you know, paint companies, for, for example. This is uh, in my view, one of the few kind of bright spots uh, in terms of uh, community resilience and uh, the transformation of public realm. Our streets have never been so colorful and interesting uh, as in recent days. And uh, speaking of community resilience, one uh, particularly remarkable effort uh, in Seattle is that neighborhoods and individuals uh, have organized to help uh, those in need. In Seattle's Chinatown International District, uh, for example, uh, the crisis uh, hit very much uh, uh, hit uh, much earlier as the exp uh, businesses experienced a steep decline uh, due to racist fear um, uh, against the community. Uh, and uh, so, very soon after the outbreak, uh, a relief fund was set up 
uh, to help uh, the local businesses uh, organized by uh, many of the community-based organizations uh, that have been working in the community for, uh, for decades. Uh, volunteers started to fundraise and organize food delivery for our predominantly uh, senior residents after uh, the state issued the stay-at-home uh, order. And uh, so this is one example of kind of community resilience that has uh, made a difference in uh, especially uh, communities that are impacted uh, more in, this, uh, in the current uh, pandemic. And uh, there are many other uh, voluntary efforts, including one uh, that was organized by uh, my students. And so without access to uh, school facilities, uh, they formed this sort of distributed uh, production line uh, to uh, fabricate uh, personal protection equipment uh, for healthcare uh, workers. And so these are uh, pictures of uh, students uh, working at home, uh, making face shields, and uh, you know, trying to uh, make use of the limitation uh, under the concentration, but uh, still being able to uh, help others in need. And uh, with help of George Lee, a local artist, and also a former student of mine, uh, we had 552 units uh, fabricated and shipped uh, to Brooklyn, uh, New Orleans, uh, Atlanta, and also locally here. Uh, in Seattle. Uh, so efforts like this, I argue, uh, creates a form of public space uh, when the actual physical space is no longer uh, available or uh, accessible. And, and that to me uh, was perhaps the most powerful things I have witnessed uh, during the current pandemic. Uh, one that I think challenged the common assumptions of uh, how public realm and public space uh, functions. And, uh, and there are many uh, interesting kind of uh, ramification uh, that we can begin to tease out of uh, this particular kind of scenario. And uh, I'll be happy to speak more about this uh, during the discussion. Um, so thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Jeff, very good in time. Uh, we will come back uh, to your presentation later in the round table. So the next speaker will be uh, Sita Law. So now we, we move from Seattle to New York. Sita, you have to work. <laughs> uh, you're still- Can everyone hear me? Now, yes, yes. Okay. All right. So hello, everyone. And again, thank you to Louise and Hendrik. And after that very positive presentation, um, I, of which many of those same elements, Jeff, are happening in New York, there are all kinds of grassroots groups organizing to help neighborhoods, particularly people who are shut at home. But I am going to highlight um, a, 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 a different scenario. And I think it's worthwhile um, to think about that. Um, let's see, why is this not advancing? Hold on, next, let's try it this way. Okay, first I think the magnitude of the problem in New York is um, something that we all have to, you need to understand that the intensity and the amount of fear um, and the number of deaths and the total number of cases um, was, was really extreme. We're a highly dense city, but um, as many of you may know, these are two maps. I just want to show you just in case you know where Central Park is. If you can see it, and this is Prospect Park, you will note that um, the distribution of COVID cases and of tested COVID cases is very much lower in um, a wealthier neighborhoods in Manhattan, uh, in Park Slope, in uh, Carroll Gardens in Brooklyn. Uh, again, you can see it here in terms of total testing and becomes as the color gets darker in purple, as you move out into the outer bur boroughs where more people of color um, uh, 
uh, lower income individuals, African Americans and Latinos specifically, but also in Latino, uh, excuse me, Asian parts of Queens, the numbers are, this is where Elmhurst is, which you've all heard about in the news. So I think the first takeaway in New York is that there is an incredibly unequal distribution of cases that tells us nothing more about something we've already known about the inequality of access to health care, but also it's something you need to keep in your mind. All right, I'm not sure why I'm not advancing. Just a second. I'm going to try this. Um, next. Okay. New York City used public space in a variety of ways, both as triage centers. City parks remained open, but there were no team sports. Some streets were open to pedestrians. All playgrounds were closed, and parks, public space centers began to distribute face coverings. Um, at the same time, there were very different responses, and I think that's my theme for today. And one of the first was to escape the city, which um, I've been writing about in terms of it was a kind of gated community-like response. It was us versus them. This is a photograph of uh, a national of local guards on the border of Rhode Island, but these same guards are found on city, on state borders, and also in front of towns uh, as residents from New York left for smaller towns, vacation homes, and suburbs, especially wealthier and upper middle class, but um, who had second homes. New Yorkers were seen as spreading the virus while we had racism within New York against uh, Asian Americans. At the same time, New Yorkers as a general group were seen as dangerous. Roadblocks were instituted. Uh, Self-quarantines were imposed by surrounding states, including Florida. Oh, hold on. Um, that's one kind of response. There was escape the city. I see that as very class-based. There were within the city two very different responses. One is the good citizen over here in Central Park where everyone distances. They wear their mask. They're not coming in contact with another and they're using public space in the right way. And then the dangerous other, but the youth, the young, the male, uh, all kinds of aspersions against groups of people who gathered together. This also, though I don't have a slide to show it, has a, 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 a worker component. Those of you who watched the shift last night note, noted that those people who could not shelter in place, we keep talking about everyone who shelters in place, they're all the many, many, many of our essential workers are uh, African American and Latino. Um, they're going to work, they're using the subways, and um, yet they're seen as, quote, dangerous because they're seen as being in collective groups at times. So again, this citizen, good citizen, other. And then the fourth category, fourth motive, is the public space in the subway. There were 62,000 homeless individuals. Shelters in January, as you know, homeless in New York City are now sleeping in subway station streets. They are very scared of the density of shelters during COVID. And as of, what, three days ago, our governor now has instituted the cleaning of the subways because workers were complaining, those the essential workers, that they were dirty and smelly. And now those homeless individuals have been swept out of the subway and stations. And to date, we don't know where they're going. All right, so the importance of public space in third places. Um, I think that ultimately, my, my, well, I want to point to the issues of social justice and social health. This is the CUNY School of Public uh, Health weekly survey. Most New Yorkers turn to public spaces during 9-11. Social distancing is very painful. I see people coming, not coming into re regular contact with others, can metastasize into from prudent health advice to paranoia, and it's threatening social justice principles. Um, as you can see, 46% or 48% of New Yorkers are ready to go out into leisure, park, recreation.
location and to accommodate um, New York is opening up streets. We have seven miles open and the idea is that we will open to 100. It is unclear, again, back to the first map that I referred you to, uh, whether or not they will be all in the neighborhoods that we really need. I didn't have time to go through, but it's the large public spaces are in the wealthier communities, not necessarily available in others. And so then what we're doing on the ground, um, a number of New York based groups have come together to be able to try to uh, take action against what's going on. The Public Space Research Group, we're doing news initiatives, webinars, and creating a network. New Yorkers for Parks are doing advocacy for open streets and starting a fair play potential, a petition. We are trying to not get the New York City uh, budget cut for uh, public space. Project for Public Spaces has a long list of webinars. The CUNY uh, School of Public Health has all these incredible health and well-being updates. And the Center for Active Design has new guidelines for COVID management, particularly in housing and also for public space. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sita. Also very good in time. So we now move uh, straight south from uh, New York to Luis Alfonso. Uh, so Luis, uh, you can start your presentation. Okay, how are you? Let me share screen. Okay, you can see it? Coming, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, yes, I will explain to you what, had, what happened in Guayaquil. Guayaquil was very famous uh, the last month because it was in South America, the city with the most cases in, of COVID-19, where the death toll was uh, horrendous. Even the, the city suffered a lot in the, because there were no sufficient hospitals and sometimes there was a lot of cases. Um, let me, okay. A lot of cases that in, in Twitter uh, with a couple of friends we made a campaign that uh, with a hashtag we are we were begin to mapping the the death in the in their houses and in some cases the bodies just were recovered uh, like five days or seven days for the police to just to recover the the bodies well. That is just what happened in Guayaquil, so you can understand what uh, the case. What happened with public space in the city? Well, in, in Guayaquil, there is a lot of problems in the public space. The sidewalks are very short, in only like a meter, a meter and a half. And in, in during COVID, was the places where people put their bodies of the disease, because there was no space to put it, there was no cemeteries, there was no uh, people that recovered the bodies. So that was happening in the city. In other places, because the lack of space in the sidewalks, the people have to use the street to do the lines. Even they don't, they don't have the space to have social distancing, so that became a problem in the, in the past weeks. The public transportation is also a other problem because even now in the city, the municipality take action in making some ordinance and some laws that in all the buses just have to be the half of the quantity of people that can be in the, in the buses, they are not respected because the public transportation, the public transportation have the lack of efficiency. Also the informal markets, um, is a real problem because in here in this city there is like the 45 percent of people that have that work in informally so in the first weeks of the of the pandemic the, the people were in quarantine the there is one there was no a market there was no informal markets but in the couple of weeks uh, they began to go out in the street, and even there is uh, another control uh, police. It's, it's happening. The sustainable mobility is now a necessity. Be, um, right now, there is a couple of collective and organizations in the city.
Uh, something is wrong with the, the audio of Luis Alfonso. I cannot hear. Alfonso, are you still here? Maybe we wait for a moment. Uh, obviously, some places have more difficulties also with their online capability. Alfonso? Alfonso, you are you're back, uh, but I think we lost your presentation in the middle. Maybe do you want to still add on the, your last uh, two slides? Or... Yes, in, in this presentation. Um, well, I was telling that infor uh, informal markets are now happening in the city, in the public spaces, because there was no policies in how they work this problem, this urban pro problem, before the emergency. So this is what's the urgency that we are now have to deal with it. Also, sustainable mobility is now an urban necessity. Right now, there are some collectives that are trying to make that the municipality adopt this right now. They, they make uh, emergency cycle lanes. Mm -hmm. Okay, in, in all the literature and all in, in a couple of weeks, we'll see that urban planning have to readapt or have to change according the, the necessities and according what happened uh, after COVID-19. So in Guayaquil where um, the discussion in urban planners and the collective right now is to understand the urban scale because the city was always think about as a city, but right now we have to adopt the concept of neighborhood. Uh, there, are some, there are centralities in the city. So we have to develop the centralities as the as adopt the services and infrastructure to to develop the necessities to show the city as I mean the uh, reduce the mobility of all the in the scale of the city the the informality have to be part of the design uh, for many years there was a discussion the informality of market of housing have to be solved but never have the the decision, the political decision to confront this problem. Right now, this must have to be. And for the last, the city participation in the new model of the city post COVID-19, because there is a new necessities of the new urban design and also in urban of the, in design of the public spaces to develop a more comfortable for the people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Luis Alfonso. Um, just also for our audience, uh, the idea also of this first uh, uh, session is really to, to have a quite broad uh, representation of different topics. And there will be later uh, a number of focused uh, webinars. For example, we are already planning to look at, for example, informality under and uh, uh, and uh, pandemic and so on so or health disparity uh, where we then can go much more further into into detail uh, of particular questions um, okay i want to come to the last uh, speaker to amona helmi um, do you want to share your presentation you're still muted also Okay, now if you can hear me. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, COVID-19 is not uh, uh, differentiating between people in different countries or continents, but maybe uh, culture and traditions in different countries and uh, continents uh, can perceive differently the COVID-19. So today I'm going to focus more on uh, the Middle East uh, uh, area uh, under COVID-19 uh, which perceives um, this 
pandemic as physical distancing, but not social distancing. Um, so, yeah. So, of course, um, as every part of the world, when we started the, this issue of COVID-19, uh, governments in different countries uh, started to uh, sanitize and disinfect uh, this virus um, on several scales. Here we have in Dubai in the streets and here we have uh, in Lebanon in Beirut and uh, people are still hanging around as, as you see and this was the beginning of uh, the case and here of course in, in Egypt in, in Cairo where we have the pyramids and they are trying to disinfect the pyramids. Uh, it's a mission impossible by the way but anyways. Um, after this, and after we got many cases uh, infected, um, different countries started to uh, shut or to close the public space completely uh, for people. And here we have some examples uh, from Saudi Arabia. So here I'm not going to talk only about the public spaces, which is the outdoor common public spaces uh, around the world like for example the waterfront here in Jeddah which was considered um, um, an essential part of the lifestyle of Saudis if you can see the small photo here uh, showing how it was uh, uh, fully uh, uh, occupied by people uh, between entertaining between uh, socializing uh, for children to play and now it's completely empty people are not allowed uh, to go uh, outside in the outdoor areas but it's not just limited to this uh, in the gulf area or the gulf region there is a very important typology of public places which is indoor public places uh, so shopping malls for example in saudi arabia in the united arab emirates kuwait qatar and so on is not just considered a place for shopping but it's, it's a place for gathering, for activities. People are going there uh, for many reasons, not only to shop. And the problem is that these places were also uh, closed for people. Uh, here we can see um, how it is very empty in Sheikh Zayed Road in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. And if you are familiar with this road, this is the busiest road uh, in Dubai and in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, same here in downtown in uh, Cairo, Egypt, uh, where the curfew was uh, more uh, during the night, while in, in Emirates, for example, or in Dubai, it was uh, something like 24 hours, unless you have something uh, uh, urgent or emergency. And also of the curfew, uh, the mindset of people did not accept that um, they cannot socialize, so uh, they started to go out not only to do some urgent and important uh, things, and they started to socialize, to do shopping, to do, to also to do some sort of recreation. Here in the middle, for example, we have a traditional market or souk in Egypt, and this lady uh, insisted to buy these uh, lanterns, which is uh, very much related to Ramadan months. Uh, so people are not. Um, so much following uh, rules, and maybe uh, Feza uh, spoke about this, the good people. And also during uh, the curfew uh, time, which is night in Egypt, uh, I was able to spot some people who are um, uh, stealing some minutes to physically being together, and they resisted to be uh, remotely uh, um, socializing or talking so they insisted to go and to be uh, side by side and to talk there. And by the way, this is one of the gated communities in Cairo called Rehab City. So the question is, can social uh, adaptability um, reach it here? Uh, can, for example, uh, distance gathering work instead of physical gathering? Here we have two examples, one from uh, Lebanon Beirut to the right, and you can find a balcony first day celebration for uh, a quarantined uh, woman or a lady in, in Lebanon. Uh, her neighbors were uh, trying to give her some uh, cheerings uh, through the windows, balconies, and celebrating her uh, first day. And here uh, in, in Egypt, me and my husband were celebrating uh, via Zoom session uh, a birthday uh, for our uh, neighbor 
and also some other people from different continents, from Canada, from Europe, and from different parts uh, uh, in Cairo were celebrating together. Uh, can this be considered a solution instead of physical uh, uh, gathering? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, of course, there are benefits uh, for having this uh, quarantine or the curfew or uh, having some trees to the nature. And for example, here we have the skyline of the Manama city in Bahrain, uh, which could be seen uh, from clearly, as you see here, uh, from the Mam Cornish, which is in Saudi Arabia. So now you can even overlook the uh, other countries because now the nature is more calming, more relaxing than before. Uh, but again, will this calming and relaxing um, will direct us to be uh, having not livable places, but best places? I'm, I'm not sure, or bad places. Uh, would say uh, here, for example, uh, this is a photo uh, in April 2019 in Alexandria, uh, a city in Egypt, and this is uh, the same, more or less the same part, but uh, it was taken uh, one uh, year ago. One, one year after this, which is during the quarantine, and you can see how uh, the place is not livable as before. So can the mindset of people accept uh, the social distancing, the physical distancing, and will public spaces uh, will remain with the same characteristics after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, for example, will it be redesigned differently to consider physical distancing? Or will it be having other innovative approaches for safe gathering? Can the public spaces be replaced with privatized public space uh, as a solution for this? All of these are open-ended questions. No one can answer it for now. Um, this phenomena of uh, COVID-19 started to be uh, very interesting to uh, different uh, scholars. And uh, in one of the interesting um, uh, research papers that was published recently, there was a question about what will be the socio-spatial implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. And there was a lot of uh, factors uh, uh, interrelated and correlated that might change our urbanism and the dynamic of our urbanism. Um, I think um, I opened uh, lots of questions that I personally don't have answers to it. Uh, I hope we can discuss some of it in our uh, webinar today and stay safe and thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you to our speakers, uh, Jeff, Seta, Luis Alfonso and Mona for providing this very informative overview. Um, as Hendrik said uh, before, we are um, having uh, other speakers from other geographical areas, so we are trying to cover as many countries as possible. And uh, so we will have also speakers soon from, uh, from Australia and New Zealand for uh, following uh, webinars. Um, now, uh, I would like to give the floor to Jose Chong from the Global Public Space Program at UN Habitat. I'm very glad to have Jose uh, with us today. Um, uh, you know that uh, we work uh, at the general public space uh, with the UN Habitat uh, to uh, review all contents uh, before publication. So Jose is um, working closely with us uh, for the review of uh, all content uh, from a UN Habitat perspective. And we are now currently strengthening the collaboration uh, for, uh, you know, have a, a more um, significant impact uh, only in regard uh, to UN Habitat uh, objectives uh, and goals. Uh, and so thank you, Jose, for joining. No, thanks, thanks a lot, Luisa, uh, for, for the introduction and also for the briefing and also thanks to the previous speakers uh, for the good presentation. So I think like uh, we have a good variety like uh, between a uh, conversation relating to community resilience and the importance of communities on the, uh, on the, on the response. Also said, uh, discussing about inequalities in cities and how it is affected like, uh, to different kinds of populations living in cities, but also experiences uh, have, uh, coming like, uh, from, from, from Ecuador 
that uh, focusing on informality. That is something that is uh, also from Habitat side, uh, we are focusing on uh, how this is affecting to, to the communities. And uh, we end up with Mona uh, discussing about the different questions that now we have to change like at this paradigm of uh, city living and, and public space. And actually my presentation, it will be a reflection uh, from the public space program and also from Habitat response uh, to uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. And I wanted to remember that three months ago we were in the World Bank Forum uh, where we uh, actually changed one of the events uh, that is like a working, we have been working with Wuhan uh, for three years now, like a how to increase uh, the awareness of, of public space, how to uh, make the design more participatory and even like a, we created the, the, the first place making week in, in China. So it's like a, we uh, have like a, this event like a trying to support Wuhan and three months after actually like a, we have to learn a lot of the lessons that, uh, that, uh, that Wuhan uh, has applied like a, to stop the, the virus spread but also like a, a how they are recovering like a, now to the, uh, to the uh, public life. Uh, I wanted to remember like a uh, from a uh, habitat perspective and what is happening with the world now uh, because it's like a, this virus is related to uh, what is happening uh, is happening mainly in cities. Uh, we have around 1,500 cities uh, that are affected for COVID-19. So it's like a, it is around the 95 of the total cases of COVID-19 are in urban settlements. So this is a virus that is spreading in cities. And it's like a, uh, but in conditions where uh, physical distancing and sanitation is almost impossible in certain settings where we have 1 billion of people living in formal settlements. And remember that we have uh, 7 billion people uh, in, in, uh, living in the world. And where we have 1.8 billion people with inadequate housing on overcrowding. So around 20% of the world in living in these conditions. And also we have 2.4 billion of people living without safe water and sanitation. So this uh, recommendation that is coming for the World Health Organization is, is very complicated like, to achieve, like, or almost impossible for certain uh, population. Uh, and this is exacerbating the risk of violence for women and children. We have seen like, how this partial and total lockdowns has affected now uh, vulnerable groups. And also, uh, we have to remember that, uh, that about the livelihood of the urban poor, that is now uh, the countries are locked down for one month and two months, and not even like a developed countries can support uh, the livelihood of, of people uh, with this uh, uh, lack of accessibility to jobs. So uh, I wanted to remember also the global agendas and coming like from the United Nations, um, is uh, we have uh, this uh, in the reflection is like a this has accelerated like a, the, the global agenda that we have. We have the sustainable development goals. One of the goals is related to, to health and well being, is the goal three that is ensure healthy life and promote well being for all at all ages. But also the relation with the built environment with uh, the specific uh, goal on cities that is make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And we have a specific target uh, related to public space. That is important. And more now than ever, it is important like, uh, to relate like a uh, health and cities uh, to, uh, to recover like, uh, for this uh, pandemic. Uh, from the United Nations perspective, it's like a, uh, and, and the response, uh, we are focusing in three tracks, mainly uh, health uh, response, humanitarian response and socioeconomic response. Because we have to remember that there are three crises happening at the same time. Not, it's not only the health response, it's like we are talking about humanitarian and also socioeconomic. Even some countries, uh, for example, in Africa, uh, we have uh, been having meetings with, with uh, different countries, and they were saying that the socioeconomic crisis came before the health crisis because of the lockdown situation, because of the lack of uh, uh, economic activities, etc. So it's like we have to remember that. And like from the habitat side, what we are focusing mainly is like the more vulnerable groups, uh, and we are supporting local governments and uh, community organizations, like uh, giving informal settlements, providing uh, accurate data, uh, like uh, to have informed decisions on how to combat uh, the pandemic. But also, uh, we are focusing mainly on how to mitigate the economic impact and initial recovery of, of these cities. 
Um, you can, you're welcome to join like a, from, from Habitat site, like a, we have a lot of resources now online and what we are doing as a, as a, is, is like a trying to collect like different initiatives, like a, we have a campaign where we are calling to the different organizations and I think like a, we are very well represented here, like a, to submit uh, what you are doing like a, for your communities and actually the presenters uh, and I think like a CETA uh, with the group, like a, they were doing like a certain concrete actions that is like a, you can documented and also like to share that information to other uh, partners. Um, I wanted to, to focus now on public space because we have like a, this kind of two phases of public space. No, it's like a place that is a place where it's a threat for urban health. So it's like a, you have approaches from certain cities that are avoid like a, to go to a public space. They basically, they have shut down the, the public space. But also a public space has demonstrated as a critical infrastructure for the functioning of the city, no? It's like a, to guarantee food supply, to guarantee like a, the access to health services and facilities, and also for the well-being of the people. Certain cities as New York have decided like a, to keep open public space for physical, mental, and emotional, eh, eh, emotional health. And this is something that we are seeing now that the more and more important uh, uh, that countries are now like in two months uh, uh, total lockdown, no? So like the important like, uh, like to have like at least like a place where you can have certain uh, minimum physical activity with uh, physical distancing. And what we are uh, promoting is to have uh, at least like an important public space to have short-term interventions. Uh, and what has demonstrated that uh, public space is an asset uh, in time of crisis. And uh, in cities that has a complete inventory of public space and facilities, has managed uh, actually like a, to respond quickly like a, to uh, the emergency uh, response and recovery. Because like a, you have the database in place like a, to uh, have evidence uh, how to allocate, for example, uh, health facilities and how to distribute uh, food supplies, etc. Uh, something that we have seen and we are uh, in many cities is like a, the repurposing of the land allocated to streets that is uh, allowing at least like a physical distancing uh, for no motorized uh, mobility activities. We have seen many cities that are uh, doing now open streets, uh, Lima, uh, Bogota, Paris, uh, Milan, etc. And uh, also it is important like, uh, to keep like, uh, this multifunctionality and flexibility of public space and to quickly ad adapt like, uh, to the demands uh, of the crisis, no? for example, the congestion of markets, temporary health facilities, food distribution, sanitation facilities, etc. And uh, public facilities, uh, we see that this is important because it provides the services for marginalized communities. Seta uh, 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 was mentioning, for example, that, uh, that the amount of homeless that are now in the streets in, in, in uh, in, in New York, and for example, they can uh, provide like a quarantine uh, facilities uh, for vulnerable population. And at the end, public space is important for the livelihood, uh, particularly for low income population. No? Like uh, we have in uh, different regions, like uh, for example, in Africa, 61% of, of the economy is informal. So it's, uh, it's like, a, and you have daily wagers. So it's like, a, if you avoid to keep the people going to the public space to move around the city, it's like it will be impossible and we will have they will face famine uh, quite, quite soon. Um, in the long term uh, uh, interventions, like a, at least like a, we need to assure that it's a equitable distribution of public space. And this is something that is quite important and we are promoting to have a complete network of public space, at least like a, uh, an open public space 10 minutes walk from home. Uh, and it's like a, you see that in informal areas, for example, in Ecuador, it's like a, you don't have like a, this possibility like a, to have open space. And then like, to plan for self-sufficient neighborhoods, uh, at least like, to have uh, at least 15 minute city that is promoting, like, for example, for Paris, that it was before the pandemic, but now this has, uh, as, uh, the crisis has accelerated certain processes on urban planning that can allow like, to adapt very quickly uh, with this new thinking about how to make uh, the city better. And then like, uh, we have seen that urban design, we will have to face another thinking about how to, to design the space, also the use of, of materials, but also the management and maintenance of public space. And it's like, uh, there is an example of cities who has an authority of public space or at least a management system that has support the, uh, the health teams like, uh, to respond better like, uh, for uh, the crisis, uh, to stop avoiding uh, the, the, the virus. But also, like, uh, uh, we see that the public space will be key like, uh, to the recovery of the public life and the well-being of, of, of everyone. So it's like uh, we will have like, a true community engagement, uh, true place-making activity, true participatory uh, processes. 
my final remarks uh, is related that now it's like a, we are uh, facing a, a time like a, uh, that is like a, we have to have a paradigm shift on city building. Uh, so it's like a, we have to uh, relate all the collaboration between the communities uh, of practice uh, and policy makers and like uh, to think how the city post COVID should be now. Uh, for the network, and I think like a lot of the partners of the public space journal will focus on documentation, learning, and changing. And there is vast sort of information now online, but it's like a how to have a, a real systemized, systematized information that we can share and to be useful also for the local governments because they are overwhelmed with, with the current situation. So it's like a, they don't have the ability like a, to choose the, uh, the practical example that they can apply in, in their cities. But also like how to place health in the in the certain of the agenda of urban development. It's, it's uh, historically we health and urban planning has been uh, always related, but we lost in some point like a disconnection. So it's like we have to strengthen that, and uh, the commitment of communities and governments like to build more inclusive agendas. No, we have seen that these inequalities happening in the cities it exacerbated like uh, the uh, the abilities like uh, to have access to services but also uh, the, uh, the health conditions uh, and also put in risk to, to everyone. Um, uh, the Ebola response uh, and the lesson from there is like a, the communities, uh, they were uh, key and essential to, uh, to avoid uh, the spread of Ebola cases. And so it's like a disconnection with local governments and communities is, is very important. So I wanted to end up uh, with uh, the importance of uh, we are having like a, this kind of uh, global pandemic, but this global pandemic affects uh, different to everyone. So in this quote uh, of uh, the UN Secretary General says that COVID-19 anywhere is a threat for people everywhere. Thanks a lot. Ah, thank you, Jose, for, uh, for your intervention. That was very useful to frame uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, from the global perspective of uh, UN Habitat. And uh, yes, it's, uh, it's a threat for uh, everyone, everywhere. Uh, so we, we, that's why actually we have decided to start this initiative, especially because uh, we are in two public space uh, at so many levels uh, from many different uh, backgrounds and perspectives. So we are trying to provide uh, our response, as I said at the beginning, but also try to uh, contribute uh, to the discussion if there is any chance that we also find uh, solutions or we can actually inspire solutions uh, for communities, uh, especially for communities at the neighborhood level, as uh, the speakers also highlighted and to actually find opportunities for different uh, groups uh, to work together and also to um, put in place uh, some of the policies that many cities and country, countries are struggling nowadays to, to put in place because this emergency found everyone completely unprepared. Yes, Hendrik? Okay, uh, yeah. I. I wanted to uh, shift to our roundtable discussion. We basically have uh, now still half an hour left because uh, we promised every attendee that uh, this uh, Zoom meeting will not be longer than one and a half hour. Um, and I want to start basically the discussion um, so with some questions at the beginning that we also announced before. And then uh, we will later, I think we have 14 questions of others that came in. So we, we might uh, go to some of those uh, uh, then afterwards. Uh, but I want to uh, start the discussion with the question, uh, um, what are the key issues for public space under the pandemic and beyond? Uh, many of you have already uh, mentioned that basically everywhere, somewhere in your presentations, but maybe it's uh, interesting to tease it out a little bit more uh, and, and also then see the nuances uh, between the different uh, places, if you know, if we just concentrated on one of those questions. So is there somebody who wants to say something? Sita? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think for, for from the New York point of view, it is, 
the inequality and inaccessibility of both public space and streets, um, the uneven distribution, and then the sort of sociological phenomenon of the increased racism, um, uh, uh, demonizing of groups that are responding very differently, um, and how that relates to the use of public space. How is it in the other locations? Anyone want to, to answer from the other person? Uh, yeah, so I think just to echo what uh, said, I just said, I think uh, you know, this, this social disparity, I think is even more kind of pronounced mm -hmm. now under the pandemic. I think one of the, uh, and there's a kind of interesting connection to uh, public space. Uh, one of the things that have become evident in the uh, current crisis uh, is the, the critical importance of passing open space, you know, a chance for people to, uh, go out, uh, uh, you know, get fresh air, uh, to see other people, to get over, you know, this, this kind of social isolation. And so we have seen increasing use of public space uh, when people are allowed to uh, do so. And but that at the same time, it also reminds us that uh, not everybody uh, have an equal access to uh, open right. space, especially you know the one that needed uh, the most. Uh, so the uh, the unsheltered uh, folks, for example. Uh, you know, Seth, I mentioned that uh, uh, they are not able to, uh, you know, go to subway now, and the same in uh, places in Seattle uh, that you know, that off limits, you know, like, like community centers, for example, that people could uh, used to go to, uh, you know, satisfy their basic needs. Uh, are gone. You know, like, yeah. are gone. Uh, so, yeah. Gone. So like off completely off limits, and so those people are bearing you know, the kind of the unfair burden on the current uh, pandemic. So I think that's uh, one of the issue. Uh, the other issue that I see is uh, sort of you know, under the pandemic and then beyond is this uh, notion of community resilience and how you know, public space can kind of help you know, facilitate that. And uh, as we can see uh, under the current crisis and repeatedly out in other disasters that uh, Community that are more organized are also the one that seem more prepared and capable of coping uh, with the impact. And uh, so, how can we invest in community building in the long term through public space? How can we help community that do not have those capacity, our uh, institutions prepare uh, to do so? And and uh, in Seattle, unfortunately, you know, we, we we have a, a program that is kind of world uh, renowned, you know, the neighborhood matching fund program. Uh, and but the program is actually not on hold uh, when it's needed the most to help uh, the community kind of get over the current crisis. So I think that's kind of another issue that that is worth kind of looking at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want it to just, add. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, Louis, sorry, Louis, Louis Alfonso, maybe you you go first, and then yeah. yes, I just want to add that I think that right now after COVID nineteen we have to the public space have the challenge to become spaces with more trust and credibility for the people. Um, not only giving trust about securities from crime, but also for health. I mean that right now people are afraid to go out. So, so, so the new point of view of public spaces have to be that there's, there are safe, place, safe spaces for all people, even in a pandemic. So, the urban design must change. Um, I have to adapt this new reality where social distancing will be the new trend in some, in some places, but also have to consider that, that social distancing has not to be the promoting of social fragmentation in the public spaces, because there will, there will be a contradiction about how public space should be. In just, uh, for one example, for uh, spaces where uh, people can meet, uh, can stay, but in other cases where people can be infected. So that will be how uh, from the urban planning and urban design should have a gap in this new reality. Mona and Jose, is there? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I, I spoke about uh, these issues uh, um, while I was presenting my, my presentation. 
but maybe the key issue here will be about uh, um, the fear of people to use the public space uh, as usual after COVID-19, of course. And um, I'm not sure about which principles uh, and uh, design aspects could be implemented in, in open spaces uh, in order to balance between having the public spaces uh, serving as usual as places for gathering, places for socializing, but at the same space not having lots of physical distancing. So this is um, one of the uh, dilemmas that maybe will be faced by urban designers after uh, we go back to our norm life. Uh, so this is something still uh, questionable, how to use uh, the public spaces normally while we still have this uh, kind of uh, um, uh, the we are affected all emotionally and physically by uh, this virus and uh, of course this will affect the uh, urban design principles in designing the urban uh, spaces and the public spaces of course uh, Jose and then Zita, or or other way around. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, Jose, uh, maybe. Yes, I, I I wanted to reflect a little bit because uh, we have been involved in, in many webinars, like a three last week. Uh, we have two this week, and it's like a, we have seen like a lot of uh, information coming like a, from practitioners and cities, and and actually it's, it's quite interesting. Every time that I mention like a one year without public space, that is the sort of uh, motto uh, of like uh, this series of webinars, like, uh, the, the people start scaring about it, no? And, like, uh, because it's, like, uh, and it's very powerful in a sense that now that people are not allowed to go to a public space, they realize they are important in their, in their normal life, no? And it's like, uh, also there is huge discussion about what will be the new normality, no? After the, the crisis, because in reality, uh, the way that we interact in public spaces uh, will change until we don't discover the, the vaccine. But also uh, that is like a these kind of diseases are more frequently, maybe like a, a way that also that we have like a, this kind of urban model will have to change and adapt. Internally, we are doing us also process like a, to rethink the principles that we are thinking of, of, of promoting in public space. There is a lot of discussion about density and, and compact cities and it's like a for example, in Wuhan, uh, it was uh, now like uh, the, uh, uh, the car sellers are like uh, selling a lot of cars every day because the people are afraid even to go to uh, the public transport. So it's like a, we are, it, this could be very dangerous because now we have a, a dichotomy between like a, the model that is more private oriented or more protect yourself or to open up with proper physical distancing. No? So it's like a, we are having in a paradigm shift that we are seeing as an opportunity that we are having more open uh, open streets like a more like a using the, the space like a, for example for cars now like a two uh, no motorized transport to, for bicycles and in certain parts of the world like a, the bicycle now is, is, a, is a commodity because uh, is uh, the, the price has increased etc et but it's like a it, i think we are in this critical moment that we have to rethink and I think that as a, uh, as a people who are passionate for public space, we have to advocate about the importance of public space on times of crisis, but also for the recovery of crisis. I think this is a fundamental thing uh, to, to, to discuss also here. And, uh, and then it's like a, a, the other thing is uh, how uh, this crisis has accelerated certain processes. For example, the plan of Milan uh, or what is happening in, 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 in Paris or like a, what is happening in Lima or in Bogota uh, is something that the people knew that should happen, no? like uh, to have more uh, uh, network of public space in informal settlements, or like uh, to have like a more accelerated process of non-motorized mobility, etc. No, so it's like a, this could be a, an opportunity to accelerate certain processes that we already knew, like uh, to have a good model of city. No, but it's like a, and, and this is I think this is key, and I have uh, heard that like uh, from 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 many cities around the world. They knew where was the problems. But now, like the crisis has exacerbated that problem, and has, and, and now like a, has uh, everyone uh, is like a, is, is is now knows that it's like a, this urban model, and also uh, that we are uh, developing is not sustainable in the longer term. 
think Seta, you had uh, still. Uh, I, I just uh, wanted to add one thing. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah, yeah. I keep hearing everyone talk in some sort of normative global way. I think what I is the most important thing is that we realize that this experience is different for different groups of people and in different neighborhoods and by age, class, race, gender. And we keep talking about public space in general. And I think that to do a really good job of this, that we need to break it down and think about these differences that an informal settlement and a street in Ecuador or uh, a wealthy neighborhood around Central Park in New York are not the same and that we need uh, to be nuanced and subtle in the kinds of recommendations that we make um, to have a lasting effect. I'm very concerned that that our way of talking about public space is this kind of normative one. And Mona pointed out that there are cultural difference. Jeff points out that there are different degrees of resiliencies by neighborhoods. Jose is uh, pointing out that there's different kinds of economics. And I'm pointing out that there are different whole new sets of um, uh, symbolic categories emerging. It, well, I don't know what to call it, but othering that's occurring. All uh, uh, new ways of thinking about people socially that is changing. All of those things will really change um, um, it, uh, how, how we respond. Mm -hmm. I would say, uh, because I believe those three questions that we uh, line out before, uh, basically, I think most of you already in some way or another responded to this um, and we have 20 minutes left uh, and maybe five uh, will be gone for some announcements. So let's come to uh, questions from the floor. Uh, I think Ingfan went through various questions. I think there are 28 and you selected. Yeah, I think I would one first. a yeah. lot of questions. And so I just tried to uh, summarize all this question to be a couple of lot. And the first question, I think lots of the uh, audiences they would like to know uh, about how could we in this kind of a situation uh, keep the rights of a low income community still be access to the uh, public space or what's your op uh, opinions about this kind of marginalization situation seem like uh, because of the lockdown or the crisis of the public space and everything turned to be um, much more than the past. So do you have any, uh, or uh, in your places, uh, does your government has any kind of, have any kind of policies to address this kind of issues? Maybe that's one, or how could we, uh, as a community member to initiate something to, to address this issue? That's the first question from the yeah. audiences. So maybe we can start with that. Thanks, Sanfita. Anyone want to answer to this? Yes, maybe like a from uh, from our side, and it's like a, we are uh, sort of promoting like a two approaches. Like a one that is more longer term, and the other one like a to respond to the crisis. Uh, in the longer term, I think will be very important, uh, and we have like a large programs on, on Islam upgrading, so like a help improve the condition of people living in formal settlements. Uh, but also, I think this has to be accompanied with the uh, social uh, housing uh, programs. No, it's like we have seen that in many countries, like a social housing is something that is is, is not tackled, and it's like a, they have uh, led only like a the private market, like a to, uh, to to uh, to 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 have like a, the housing a the housing provision. So I think in the longer term, I think this is our two key factors that we need to to address. In the short term, it's like a, from our response and experience, for example, in Kenya, uh, what we are doing is, is uh, providing uh, now support like a, to, uh, to provide like a, uh, sanitation facilities in the public space. So at least like a, they have the possibility like a, to wash their hands uh, or like a, to, uh, for, or to clean up a little bit. Also, uh, the use of public facilities and public services uh, that is like a, they can, for example, can be a sort of a quarantine area. In Lima, uh, they are using uh, some public facilities uh, as a way to uh, uh, allocate uh, or like uh, to host uh, the homeless people. So I think like uh, you have to uh, think that it's like a uh, vulnerable community, like uh, they will have to, well, they will need to have like uh, this support. Uh, and uh, also it's like uh, how to uh, allow them like uh, to, I think like uh, to have 
certain sort of income. Because no, we know that if like, uh, these people, like uh, maybe they can survive like, uh, one week or one week and a half, but it's, then it's, like, uh, you will have to provide them like, uh, with a certain food supply, cash contributions, uh, certain governments are doing that. But uh, many countries, they don't have the possibility, so they, they will have to go to work eventually. So it's like a, the decision that some of them are facing. It's like, a, should I stay here and, 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 uh, uh, and, and, and without anything to eat? Or like, I should go and face the, the crisis? And right. it's like a, exactly. Uh, exactly. Income. And it, I think it is fundamental. And, uh, and for example, it's like a, the congestion of markets, no? at least. Uh, or like a, to be able like a, to move safety around the city. I think that there are issues in the, in the medium and longer term also. Sita, mm -hmm. you, you still want to add something to this? Or, yeah. No, I think okay. this is great. Yeah. Um, shall we have one more question from the audience? Uh, yeah, and that, um, I, I think a lot of our audience is like also curious about uh, what will be the future of our public space. And especially, we are talking about uh, planning and urban design under this kind of field. Will this kind of like a social distancing turn to be a key, key, key elements we need to take care of in the future design, or, or how could we, how could that turn to be? And also, maybe another thing, uh, question is about, uh, could we also use the public space as a, as a key point to do some resilient design to help our society or community in the future to rehabilitate that from this pandemic crisis. Anyone wants to answer? Sita? Mm -hmm. I have so many different answers. Um, I think the distribution, I think that the biggest issue that's coming out of ev every webinar I've been in is it's the distribution of public space. And I think Jose, you talk, already spoke about that eloquently, that the, that the amount of public space and the distribution of its inequal, in, inequal distribution and the unequal use of even streets, let's say from a pedestrian, for who can use the streets and when they can use the streets for pedestrian versus not will change. And I think that um, there certainly will be in many countries uh, I hope I see in the United States um, more alternative systems of movement. I, however, also agree with something that I think was brought up by all the panelists that I think there is concern about the decrease in use of, uh, it was actually Jose also, the decrease in use of uh, public transportation and an increase in private transportation. But my other response to this is that. Um, Again, I come back to the social part of it. I, I, I think that um, in terms of planning, there is only going to be so much we can do as city planners or urban planners or design planners to reconstruct the way public space will be. I think it's a social process also that we're involved in. Uh, Jeff seen the positive, Seth has seen the more negative that will, no, but seriously, in terms of what public space can be, I can show you public spaces that are really working effectively. And if we get a hundred miles of streets where people really can walk, and I see that as a really positive way of going forward and imagining the future of the city in which we will have epidemics. But I can also show you the other spaces that Jose and I was actually talking about where people are coming together and clustering in ways that will in fact promote infection and that that's to me a social issue, not just a physical design. Yeah, I think the, the other side of the coin is that even though you know the social distancing is now seen as a necessity, but we are also seeing there's a desire to you know become even more kind of socially connected, right? Right. Uh, so how can we uh, kind of foster that through the design of public space, uh, either through you know a better, more equitable kind of distribution of public space, and also how like within each public space, how can we kind of facilitate those kind of social connections? Uh, it's now become even more important that this kind of you know the deep human uh, needs to to be uh, to be connected, uh, and how can we support that through public space? 
I mean, the big question that came out last night was, is virtual space going to be the connection? And then will inequality also pervade that and yes. that our internet is private, Jeff? So, I mean, yes. I think that that's something we're not talking about here and I'd love to have a session sometime, but if it's, if the internet is private and we want to promote public space and we know public space does things that the internet can't do, especially for community resilience, how do we participate in that? I think we, there will be certainly one, one session on the <laughs> digital part uh, as well. It's already in discussion. Uh, how about uh, Mona or Louise? Uh, anything from, from your side? Or, or yeah, Louise? yeah, I think so. Yeah, you go first. Yeah. No, please. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, there are many ideas on how to uh, redesign existing public spaces or how to, to design the new public spaces. And uh, maybe I mentioned some of it as questions. Can we do some sort of limitation uh, uh, of usage? Can the, um, um, the increase of using the internet and the social uh, 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 venues uh, through the internet can uh, having uh, less load on the physical spaces. Of course, we cannot ignore the role of the physical spaces in, in social interaction, the genuine one, I would say. Uh, but but uh, we cannot ignore the fact that uh, now we are talking to each other more, even in, in maybe in the same family, they can talk to each other using the WhatsApp instead of just, just going out and staying uh, uh, in the reception and talking with each other. So I think uh, we can uh, reach uh, a design solution that are balanced between uh, the social interaction and at the same uh, way, not uh, very much condensed with the physical interaction, I would say. Uh, of course, there was um, many successful um, examples in uh, some of the Gulf cities that I used to live in or to work in. And uh, this was done in public spaces. The, um, I would say the physical partially segregation because of the culture, but maybe this could be uh, um, uh, seen as one of the solutions where uh, the public space were divided into um, different uh, seating uh, units which accommodate a few number of people so you can stay with the um, with some people, but not a big number of uh, people, of course. Uh, this was designed for families because they were very concerned about privacy and not sharing, you know, uh, people uh, um, from outside the family to, to share their seating area. But maybe ideas like this could be implemented somehow uh, to regulate uh, the flow of people in some of the public spaces. And of course, many more solutions that uh, may come in the coming days. Mm. From the politi I, see, I see this problem from a political process because there was a lot of problems inherited in the cities and also in public spaces that sometimes by some administrations, they were selective in urban planning which problem to, att to attack or to, or to try to develop some solutions. Right now, public space should be one of the priorities because it would be the, the challenge of how people will react to the, the new public spaces in the new reality. So from urban planning should be a new focus in how to try to develop the cities. From, the, from what Senna talked about, the internet, I see that it's not only the internet, but also the process that, that that happened that some private places like house, uh, like balconies, like also like reconnected with your neighborhood are now the new public spaces. So how to, the, from the architecture point of view, how to develop this new concept of city or neighborhood to adopt, to adopt this new reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would say, uh, or there, was there something you wanted still to contribute, Jeff? Yes. yes. I think uh, in uh, the studies that is, like, uh, we have conducted, uh, and it's quite interesting that trend, like, uh, 
actually like from the beginning of, uh, of, of the, century, the last century, and then it's like, a, like around 25% of land allocated to streets. And uh, in 2015, we have around globally uh, uh, around 20% of land allocated to streets. So actually in the model that we are constructing in the city, we are reducing the amount of public space. Yeah. And this is something that we have to keep in mind, like a thinking of like the trends that are happening and now what will happen with the, the city post-COVID. No, I think that this is fundamental but because naturally we were losing the uh, amount of public space and we see that it's uh, more and more important uh, for that. I think like uh, the, the comment of Mr. Alfonso was quite interesting, like uh, this in between spaces because uh, normally in many cities what uh, they have done is like a they have close up like a to the street and now we have the val to see the value of the, this in between space the balcony of communication between the streets and the, the eyes of the streets etc no? so I, I think this is quite important that like, it will change our relation with the public space and uh, finally i think like a, the community is like a, that this community public space are really going to increase more and more no because like you will feel self safer in a sort of a uh, place that is, is uh, with proximity with your house so it's like i think it will be an strength of like a, this community uh, public spaces uh, in proximity to uh, your home uh, your home but i think these are three main ideas i would like like a, to join also the discussion of the virtual world because i don't think that will replace <laughs> the, the physical uh, public space okay i would say uh because we promised to finish in one and a half uh, hour that uh, I, even though, of course, we want to continue to discuss, but we still have many sessions for us before us, uh, that we uh, would end now the round table and uh, thank all the contributors uh, and panelists very much. Um, and before we uh, end, uh, I would give the word back to Luisa to just uh, announce uh, the further program. Uh, Luisa, do you want to? Uh, yes, uh, just to, um, maybe I can uh, share the screen uh, um, because uh, I would like to, um, yes, let me try this, sorry. Yes, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, so this initiative, as you know, is uh, part of the Journal of Public Space. If you land on the home page of the journal, you see this link here, which is the COVID-19. You click on it and you can open uh, the web page of the initiative. And if you scroll down, you see here program of activities. And we will use this page to announce um, uh, speakers and agenda of uh, future webinars. For example, we have for this webinar here, speakers and agenda and uh, registration process. And here, webinar feedback, we will publish here. It is already available actually, uh, the webinar to give feedback to this present webinar. And uh, we will uh, uh, soon publish same information for webinar number two and webinar number three. Um, and we are um, arranging uh, um, a program and, confirm and we are expecting confirmation of uh, speakers uh, in a couple of days. So as soon as we have this confirmation, we will publish uh, um, information here. Um, we also have this survey. Uh, uh, going on. So this is a general survey uh, that you can fill out uh, um, to give us a feedback uh, regarding your current situation in your city, country or neighborhood. We also have a call for speakers here. Um, you can apply in case you would like to be a speaker in one of the following um, uh, webinars. As you can see here, we have webinar number four that is repeated in every series. It's an expert group discussion with the audience. So we would like to engage um, the audience much more than we did today um, by, you know, collecting questions and trying to create a more collaborative environment so that we establish a connection uh, real connection uh, with the audience and then uh, if you scroll down again here 
we have a call for papers currently open for a special issue of the general public space, uh, which is a response to this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the deadline is May 15. We are asking for short papers of maximum 2,000 words. You can read all instructions here. Um, we actually are about to publish a special issue of the journal um, next week on uh, public health and well-being in open public spaces. This was uh, related to a previous call, uh, so this was uh, designed and planned well in advance uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic. So we will have this special issue on public health and well-being in open public spaces before the pandemic and this special one during and after, well, hopefully some contributions will also discuss the after um, uh, pandemic. And then finally, just to point out to this one, call for advisors on public space. Uh, through the Journal of Public Space, we are trying to expand our network um, of uh, um, experts uh, um, and uh, activists uh, and scholars, um, community leaders, uh, professionals, uh, city managers uh, working on public space. So the submission is also open. Thank you. Sorry, I was too long probably. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all speakers and I hope this was interesting for our uh, uh, attendees and we will go through all your questions. By this time I think it's 38 and also read the surveys afterwards. Uh, I think we kept time uh, almost uh, two minutes late and uh, I hope we will see you back uh, next Thursday. So thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of you for running it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank Claude. you.